The Live and Alive Tour is off and running. St. Louis, I will see you on August 4th and 5th. L.A., local show here, August 11th. Tampa, Florida, August 18th and 19th with Steve Simone. Springfield, Missouri, September 1st and 2nd. Tulsa, Oklahoma, September 15th and 16th. Phoenix, Arizona, September 29th and 30th. Salt Lake City, I'll see you all October 27th and the 28th. And San Francisco, California, I'm coming back December 8th and 9th. Get your tickets to all shows at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pants Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And as always, I want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody that has to find this show because YouTube likes to demonetize us and pull us out of the algorithm because we talk about real things over here. And that's all right. When you see us, you hit us, you subscribe. It's a huge way to help the show and push it back out there. Um, and look, I want to just tell you this too. If you got to have more, then you got to have the Patreon. I'm telling you, listen, for five bucks, you don't just get one episode. You get the entire back library. You're getting it audio and video. You're also getting this show, The Honeydew, a day early, no ads at no additional cost. It's five bucks. All right. If you don't like it, kill it. All right. You get it for a month anyway. So you're going to get at least four, depending on how many weeks are in that month, five episodes. You know what I'm saying? It's like a dollar an episode. And you're getting the honeydew with y'all. And it's the most insane stories you could, you can't imagine. I promise you. I promise you. So thank you for those of you out there that do support the Patreon. I know there's a lot of new subscribers there. You guys are the, you're the best. Um, if you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, then go check out my old podcast, The Crab Feast. Again, everybody you know and love in podcasting is on that show with different stories. It's a generic storytelling show with some of the most fun stories you've ever heard out there. I promise you that. Also, on tour, all right? Back's feeling better. Lungs are feeling better. We're going to start getting out there a little more, all right? We've got dates through this year. We're going to roll all the way next year as well. So August 11th, Los Angeles, local show. We're going to do a night in Flappers uh, out in Burbank, all right? Tickets are on sale for that now. August 18th and 19th, Tampa, Florida. I'm coming. Finally coming to Florida. My boy Steve Simone will be with me. We're going to have a great show down there. Come out and see us. September 1st and 2nd is Springfield, Missouri. Never been to Springfield, Missouri to do comedy, so I'm fired up to come there. And then September 15th and 16th is the Tulsa. That was the one that had to be rescheduled because they weren't open yet. So all tickets are live now on my website. Go get them, ryansickler.com. Now. That's the biz. You know what we're doing over here. We're highlighting the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers, and I am very excited to have this guest on today for the first time here, ladies and gentlemen. Alex Hooper, welcome to the Honeydew. Alex. Yay! I'm here. It does feel really good to be here. I'm glad. Listen, man. I first of all thought you had already been on here, and you're like, nah, dude, that was the crab feast. So go check out his crab feast episode because it's a great. We just talking about how you got attacked by a zebra at a zoo <laughs> on the crab. That's the kind of stories you're gonna hear over there. Um, well, thank you for being here because, uh, I didn't want to make a big deal of it, but this is our, you're going to be the last guest in this studio. So, oh my God. Yeah. Burn it to the ground, everyone. <laughs> as get, soon as we walk out of here, get the kerosene, yeah. throw it everywhere. Um, I don't know. I don't make big deals of a lot of things, but I am excited. We'll, we'll show you guys. We got, we're moving to a new studio. So, uh, thank you, Santa Monica Music Center. We're just, uh, outgrew the space. We're going to go to a bigger spot, uh, cause we got some, New exciting things coming your way that we'll get into later. But anyway, you are here. Please plug, promote Alex Hooper everything. Yeah, um, you can find me on the road, hoopercomedy.com. Got a bunch of tour dates coming up, especially starting in August. I'm hitting it very hard. Uh, Hooper Hair Puff are on my social media. And then I have a podcast weekly. It's called Dirty Briefs. It's uh, 15 minutes or less of whatever the fuck I feel like doing that week. Sometimes it's positive affirmation. Sometimes it's a list. Sometimes it's just me being a goofy fucking idiot, however I feel like it. But yeah, just something to get myself out there every week. Yeah. All right. So- Look, we've known each other for a while now. We did Baltimore together, got to tailgate at the Ravens game. Hell we had yeah. a good time, got our 
got our ass. As the game, I think we all left in the <laughs> yeah. third quarter. We got our ass beat. Um, but some people come on here. They tell a life story. You actually have uh, something to talk about. So you got married in April of 20... 2022. 2022. All yeah. right. So April last year. Yep. So you just in a year. Oh, hey. Just barely over hey, a year. Congrats. Yeah, we've been together. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you. We've been together since college. It's been a very long journey for us. Like tech, We've been in together in some form or another for 18, 19 years. And so what made you finally say, let's do it now? You know, my I had a very antiquated view on marriage because my parents, my mom and stepdad are both divorce lawyers. So I grew up thinking marriage was the worst thing you could ever do. I never had a positive outlook on That's it. Really? Were they married? <laughs> well, for a little while. And they they're, got divorced. They're both, uh, they had two divorces and three divorces under their belt simultaneous. So like, that's all I knew. And they were divorce lawyers? Yes. So they're just wrapping themselves in there like, I'm just going to do this. I think the only reason my mom and stepdad never got a divorce is because they were both afraid the other one would take all of their own, like the other one's money. Like that they were both yeah. so talented at their job. But when you grow up like that, all you hear is like, oh, this dad sucks and this mom's trying to take her kids and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, this is, I'm never doing Doing it. But my wife got me to the point where she was like, look, you're looking at the wrong examples. Why are you looking at our parents for, for like, look at our friends that are married and have perfectly happy lives. Like we should do this. And we knew we wanted to have a family. So I was like, okay, I just need to get over my own bullshit and get there. And something that really got me there is this, there's this Alan Watts quote that's, uh, you have no obligation to be the person you were five minutes ago. And when I heard that, my brain was like, oh, I'm holding on to so much inner turmoil from when I was a child that I don't even believe anymore. I just need to let this shit go. So I proposed and we got married in a beautiful wedding in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Oh, yeah. I've been there. It's beautiful now. Yeah. Though. All right. It's congrats. fantastic. Thanks. So yeah. that's April of 2022. And then shortly after that, you start notice some weird health issues. Yeah. So then uh, over, the, uh, over the next couple of months, I was extremely busy. And so I was just kind of ignoring what was going on inside of me. But I noticed my neck started to like really like thicken up. People would see me, they'd be like, are you working out a lot? And I'm like, no. And I couldn't stop touching like my, in the neck area. Was and it so sore? It wasn't sore. I could just feel these things in there. Want to touch my I head. know, it makes you want to, because I know, <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm like, are they in here? Are they in here? So then I'm at a music festival and I'm, I'm on, tri I'm tripping uh, on acid that, and I suddenly was like, something is wrong with me. And my brain is like telling me like, I'm in this trip, but I'm going like, S you need to figure this out when you get out of this festival. So I get out of the festival. I go to the doctor a week later. My doctor looks at me and is like, I think there's lymphoma. And I was like, what? <laughs> Just right like that? She, that's what she said. She said, I think this is lymphoma. You need to go get tested. I'm going to send you to a specialist. And that started a three-month journey of getting every test you could possibly imagine to test for. Basically, they were like, you have cancer. We just don't know what kind. Wow. They basically, they knew pretty much off like the Like right away that this is a type of cancer. We got to go figure it out now. So yeah. what? what is the, do you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, the difference between, I, I always hear leukemia and lymphoma linked together. Yeah. At least mentioned together, I should say. Do you know the difference? I believe leukemia is a blood cancer. Blood, okay. And then lymphoma is like lymph your lymphatic nerves, your lymphatic nerves. So the reason I, so when I was, by the time I got all my testing done and I had every, I mean, MRIs, PET scans, blood work, I had a bone marrow aspiration. What is that? Dude, <laughs> so they basically, to see if it's stage four, they have to extract bone marrow and they 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 big out a needle this big. Now, here's how you know you're about to be in a lot of pain. If there's four people in a room for one so procedure. One for each limb. Two of them were there literally just to hold me down. And they do it through your hip. Oh, and dude, in the side, like in the side. Oh, yeah. And, and they got to numb you up or something. They do, but you can't numb bones. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you learn really quickly. So they're quickly. numbing the skin to break the skin, but the bone is the bone. Dude, when it gets, you may, you will physically just go like this, like, uh, uh, and it's the weirdest pain you have ever felt because it's this 
deep, just like pinching. How long? How long are they in there? It was like six, six, seven minutes. Probably. Minutes? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. I thought you were going to say it was like in and out. No, because the doctor, he even said to me, he's like, you have very hard bones, very hard bones. And I was like, I don't need this right now. I'm, I'm getting roasted about my bones. Get out of here. And it turns out I didn't have stage four. Thank so, God. Good. yeah, I had stage three, which means it had spread from my lymph nodes in my neck all the way down to my pelvis, essentially. So they found it everywhere, but it took three months to get myself to that point. And they were like, it's Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage three. What does that mean, Hodgkin's? What is that? Because then I, I hear non-Hodgkins right. as well. All I know is that non-Hodgkins is apparently less treatable. I don't actually know the difference between Hodgkins and non-Hodgkins. Um, but but I, what makes it Hodgkins? Is there something that makes it that? Or is it always Hodgkins lymphoma? No, because there's, there's different kinds of lymphomas. But I don't know why I'm, specifically I'm it's Hodgkins. I don't know this, though. I don't either. I mean, I don't know nearly as much as I probably should, considering that I've gone through it and I lived in it every day for about 12 months. But... There's some things where you're like, part of me was like, it doesn't matter what it is. It's in me and I have it and I just need to get rid of it. And honestly, the testing period, that was the worst. When you don't know what's wrong with you, you just know something it's terrifying because you don't know how to tell your family. You don't really know what's going on inside of you. Once they told me, hey, it's stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. Here's what we're going to do to get rid of it. This 12 rounds of treatment over the next six months, chemo, no radiation. I was like, so you can get it? They were like, oh, this one? Yeah. ninety For someone your age, 95% cure rate. Whew. And so you hear that and you're like, great. Okay, then get let's let's go. And I wasn't. You know, this is one of those things where it came into my life and there's nothing you can do about it. So you just start to figure out like, okay, well, how can I learn from this experience and how can I get through it in a way that doesn't completely deplete me from who I am? And so I started doing chemo and chemotherapy was fine to the point where- Wait, just, let's pause for a second. Yeah, go for it. How just- I mean, here's what's crazy. How relieved are you, first of all? Because are you thinking the entire time this is a death sentence? 100%. Because my body, I have dealt with health issues my entire life. I have one of the worst cases of eczema you could imagine, where doctors my whole life have just looked at me and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you're a, do I don't need your sympathy here, man. Like, I need you to fix me. Yeah. When I was a kid, I would literally have pus oozing out of my face. I would wake up in the morning stuck to my own pillow. Oh. Like, it, it was off. I mean, my skin, I looked like a hot dog that was run over by a car. It was just brutal, uh, painful, uncomfortable. So I'm no stranger to health issues. And my body, it always goes to the extreme. It always like if, and so I was like, oh, it's going to be stage four. There's no way my body wouldn't allow me to get anything less than a stage four. And so part of me and was you like, have stage six. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, like, what? We've never shit? even heard of things. There was not even a five. You skipped right <laughs> over that into six. You're just hurtling <laughs> over stages. <laughs> it's, it really, I really expect them to say it. And part of me goes, oh, I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death. What I'm afraid of is complete attrition of my body, deterioration. That's the thing that scares me the most. I think also, too, when I think about it, like, uh, I guess I either assume or, or naively hope all the time that I'm going to make it to in my 80s. You sure. know, especially in this business. This business is not, <laughs> not for longevity. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> and if I can make it there... Then I'm not scared of death. I think the thing about death for me is I'm scared of of dying before what I feel is my time. You know what I mean? If Certainly. it's taken. Yeah. You know, and and you know, not to compare in any way, but I had a death scare as well. Oh, so, I know. you know, you start thinking about all those things. I mean, also you just got married. Yeah. You just got married. And you want to and the reason you finally got over all that was to start a family and this may be the end of your life. <laughs> 
Yeah, but the thing about that was, it was, if I'm dead, I don't know any better, in my opinion. Like, I'm not one of the, I don't know what happens after you die. Like, I don't, and I don't claim that I, I don't think about it really. So my thing is, I'm not afraid of when it's over because I don't think I'll know any better. I'm afraid of living in a way with no quality of life where everything mm. is painful, everything is a struggle. Yeah, you're just breathing and alive. You're a heartbeat. That's the scariest Painful thing in the world heartbeat. to me. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. And that's what I don't want. So death was never, it was like when they were like, hey, this is pretty serious. I was like, okay. Like, and I kind of just like reconciled with How that. How was your wife with it though? <laughs> I mean, I think it's worse for her. Yeah. I think it was, I think the entire experience, everything I went through, which we'll get into in a second of how bad it gets, is I think the person next to you is always going to have the harder t challenge because they have to watch you go through it standing there. They have to answer to every doctor. She's the one taking the notes because when they tell you, hey man, you have stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma, your brain goes and you disassociate immediately and you're just sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. And my wife's the one like taking every fucking note, like making sure that we know what's happening. She's also the one that has to deal with my family, her family, all of our friends. She has to answer all the questions. She's Be like your cancer concierge, you know? Yeah, this, this is it. <laughs> I, I get that. I checked in and I made sure Does I was like top of the line service, please. Please do that for cancer patients and families. Like legit cancer concierge where they just cater to your situation and help your family out and all the answer all oh, yeah. this is a brilliant idea yeah this anyone also take the stress off of your you know your wife or whoever that might be that's helping you though it's yeah because it's so confusing the first of all just our medical oh, uh, system here is confusing <laughs> enough then you gotta then you gotta mix whatever your issue is into that medical world and figure out how to work that i mean it's a nightmare so yeah man so Terrifying. You're lucky you had her there. So lucky. She was there every step of the way. She refused to miss an appointment. She runs her own business. We have two dogs. Like she has to take care of a household, a business, all that stuff. And now all of a sudden her husband is lethargic. He depressed, scared, like every, all of the things that like all of the things that basically make me who I am were suddenly stripped away because I became a shell of who I was. I didn't know how to move forward. But when the chemo started, I started to feel a little bit better. Everyone said like, hey, it's going to maybe really knock you out. It didn't knock me out. In fact, I went to every chemotherapy session, like where people were like, it's going to be scary. I went in going, I'm ready. Give it to me. Give me the medicine that will clear the shit out of me and get me back to my fucking life. Because that's like, when I found out I had cancer, all tour dates have to stop. All yeah. everything has everything. to stop. Everything. And because if it doesn't, your fucking life's about to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think I was going so hard when I first when I didn't know I had the cancer inside of me, I was going very, I was like attacking life like as hard as I could. Between like doing my own work, partying, traveling, all of the things that wear you down, I was doing to myself. So Everything's going great through chemo. I would like literally get chemo and then go play tennis and do a show at night to the point where I looked so healthy that people were questioning whether or not it was real. And I was like, what a terrible fucking bit. Really? People, <laughs> some people said that to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. It's because wild to me that anybody questions that. I remember, um, I think his name was Quincy that also had cancer. Quincy Jones. And, and, and yeah, and they questioned that as well. Yeah. Well, because people have an idea of what cancer should look like. And, if and what I'm it ultimately stage, should do to someone. Yes. And it's like, if you don't die, did you even really have cancer? Yeah, that's what happened I can't, with Quincy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that's you a terrible got thing. some of that? I got, what I got is after shows, people be like, is this real? Like, you don't look like you're They would you're say sick. this to you. Yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm not it's making this up for a wild thing bit. to say to somebody. They just don't understand when someone is attacking cancer, like, right in its face, where, like, I'm talking talking about it. I'm making jokes about it. I don't look sickly at all. So to them, if they've known, if they've seen cancer in their own life or like someone like maybe their mom had it or something and they were like, you don't look like she did. Like Fair there's enough. no way you have Fair what she enough. had. Yeah. And that's what that goes through their mind. So they're trying to reconcile in their own brain. If he looks this healthy, but he has cancer. You hadn't lost hair or anything like that at no, that point? Nothing. Nothing. And that, I think what they were thinking is if he looks this healthy and he has cancer, do I have <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe I got there. Oh, oh my God. I should stop. I got to get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, here's where it all falls to shit. So, <laughs> As if it was good at all. Because cancer was just such a light in my life. It was just so wonderful. I'm like, oh, I get to just take a break and have people take care of me. Um, here's where it starts going downhill. So two months after I'm doing chemo, it's I'm getting it every two weeks, a couple hours for an infusion. Uh, after my fourth session, I had felt great. And suddenly I started to feel really beaten down. And I got back from a show at the Irvine Improv and I was like shaking violently when I got home. And my wife was like, are you, were you like this the whole time? And I was like, no, I just didn't feel really good. She's like, go to bed. This will, we, we're seeing your doctor on Monday anyway. This is like a Thursday. I start, can't, I wake up the next day and I'm so out of it. I start canceling all my shows for the week. I'm just like, I've never, and I've never canceled anything. I'm one of those people that's like, I will show up if I'm fucking dead. And I was like, there's no way I can perform. I just can't do it. So I have to cancel shows. Seeing my doctor on Monday. Monday comes and I have to go get a PET scan to figure out where we are in the treatment process. And when I go there, I am completely delirious. I had seen my doctor that morning. They put high, they put fluids in me, said, go get the PET scan, go home, take a Vicodin and just take a nap and we'll see you very soon. So that night I go get the PET scan. I don't remember any of this. I go home, I go to sleep. It's 4 p.m. I wake up at 8 p.m. I walk out of the bedroom. My wife is sitting on the couch watching TV. I walk into our kitchen and just start taking a piss. What? And my wife- If you don't remember this, no. this is being told. Yeah, my wife turns around. She's like, Alex, no, what are you doing? You can't pee in there. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so I walked into her office and pissed all over the wall. No. Yeah. Just all over it. I did my business in the place where she does business. Like I went in there and just soaked the fucking place. <laughs> and so she comes in there and she's like, oh my God. Okay, just, okay, go to the bathroom. Uh, you like, I just did. Yeah. I just she's like, you get in the bathroom, take off your clothes. Um, okay, just, I, you're soaked. I And so I don't know what to do. She calls our, two of our best friends um, who have known, like I officiated their wedding. These are very, very close friends of ours. They come over immediately. And they find me, basically, she had put some clothes on me, so I was just clothed enough. But I, when they came over, I was so out of it. My friend Mike was like, I need you to sit down. And I looked at him and I was like, how? And he goes, there's a couch behind you. Just put your butt on it. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. They realize I'm in a very bad state. Take me to the emergency room, at which point when I get to the emergency room, they're asking me check-in questions and they go, what's your name? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. What year is it? I don't know. Who's the president? I, I don't know. Now, to be fair, the president doesn't know who the president is. True. <laughs> but, True. but it was one of those things where they immediately check me in. And I'm out of it. I don't remember any of this part of the process. I have very faint, like, flashes of memories. But essentially, then, I get into the hospital. They start running tests on me. And here's where, here's what I finally, eventually learned a few days later. My portacath which is the port that they put in to do chemotherapy. They do a surgery to put it under your chest so you don't even think about it. It's just in there. It never has to like, you know, be worried about getting wet or anything. Two months after they did it, it got infected. And I don't know it's infected because it's an internal infection. That infection spread to my heart, causing a one centimeter vegetation. What? So, well, and I have to, and I'm gonna slowly try to explain what these things are because I didn't even know. I have to, I had to research all this. A vegetation is a germ or mass of cells in your heart that is not supposed to be there and it blocks or and can block arteries. And what it will do is then that can spread and move one of two ways. It can go to your arms or your legs, or it can go to your brain. Mine decided, let's go see what's in Alex's brain and figure that out. So it spread to my brain, which was causing multiple embolisms to happen at the same time. So essentially- This is why you don't know who you are or what's going on. It's already- I'm a it's stroke. Our, yeah. That's what is happening. It's already happening. I'm having a long-term stroke. Not a, g -g 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 something's wrong here, but a just like, I just kind of feel all right, everybody. Like, just not losing my mind. Had no idea. And then basically what happened is 
I had formed, I had gotten sepsis. And sepsis is your body's extreme reaction to an internal infection where it causes tissue damage and your organs start shutting down. So when they took me to the hospital, I was essentially hours from death. Whoa. Hours. That's what they, they told my wife when I got there and they checked me in and they put me in my own, in a room and everything. They told her, you need to brace yourself. This is extremely serious and we don't know what's going to happen. And my wife is terrified, obviously. We had frozen sperm before I started doing the chemo because we knew we wanted to have a family. She had a full-on conversation with one of her sisters of, if Alex dies, do I have his child? Because I have- What would you want her to do? Fuck no. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, that's just, no, that sounds- I thought for that, sure it was that a yes. sounds like the most depressing. Every time you look at it, like, what if what if this kid's a horrible kid? And you're like, yeah, of course it is. Alex, like, Alex was a that's terrible child. Why did I do this to myself? Like, the idea of me living on through a child is, like, if, I, if I'm there for the child's life, I'm going to be a dad? Sure. But, like, oh, no, having to explain that story when they're, like, nine years old? Like, why don't I have a dad? Well, here you go. You know, it's, I, I don't think I would have wanted that. And I don't know if she, she, I think she did. I think she was all kind of like for it. But so that started the process of me. I was in the hospital for 33 days. You go in completely out of it, having no idea what's going on with you. And I didn't see the sun for 33 days. And how long were you in for? Yours was what? 30? Just, just about 30. Yeah. Right. It's, I had you a don't window know. though. After <sighs> I, after, after nine days, I, I had a window, but it was a first eight to ten days. I didn't. I had a window, had a but curtain. it still was like, and I would sit by it sometimes. But for the first two and a half weeks, I was completely bedridden. Oh yeah, my body swelled up twenty five pounds from edema, which is basically just your body's unable to release water. So I didn't. I didn't go to the bathroom for the first nine days. I was in there. I was barely eating anything either, but like all the, like, I, I had like a tube that's like a catheter and everything, but I was, my body just filled up to the point where everything hurt all the time. Okay. So can I ask you this then? If now we're having to pivot from lymphoma to take care of this, what's happening to lymphoma while this is happening? So we have to stop treatments altogether. I'm assuming. Because my body was in such a weakened state, they have to fill it with antibiotics and stuff. And chemo is just getting rid of right, everything, right. including all the good, the white cells too. So now so, how long is the game plan? How long is it before we get you right, before we can go back to attacking lymphoma? So this is when I had, at this time, I went from having one oncologist to having seven specialists a day visit me to make sure, okay, let's check his lungs, let's check his heart, let's check this, let's check this, every single thing. And my doctor, my oncologist is like, I need to get back in there and like get rid of the rest of this lymphoma. Like we were doing really well. And then I have infectious disease specialists going, you're not fucking going near this guy right now. He's gonna die if you get in there. And so everything was like, it paused essentially for treatment because all it was was we need to save this guy's life and rehab him to the point when he can get back on treatment to save continue saving his life. It was just the it's baffling to think about because I consider myself a pretty healthy person. I exercise, I eat well, I do self-care things. And so all of a sudden, everything in my body is just going, nah, nah, we don't feel like it anymore. Just fuck you, you know? That's how it felt. It felt like my, everything was turning on me. So then what happens? How long is it to get you cleaned up and, and back into um, treatment for lymphoma? So I was, so the 33 days in there, um, they're trying to deal with the sepsis. And that whole time is just the sepsis and the, the infection, thirty yeah. three, all 33 days. Yes, until <laughs> so they now did. So you're a full month off of chemo. Correct. And when I'm in there, they're doing they're doing multiple procedures every day, like MRIs and PET scans and everything else. MRIs, by the way, I was I've done MRIs in my life. The claustrophobia doesn't bother me. It does a lot with a lot of people because it's so loud. What that Not you're one the of those. volume, it's the space. Yeah, when you're right I can't. here. Yeah. Yeah. Something I was able to relax in there, except when I had the edema, they would twist my leg and they would need to stay in like one position. Oh. 
for 45 minutes. There were multiple MRIs. I scream cried through the entire experience because like there was nothing else I could do to release the pain yeah. than just cry hard. I, I just had this time I wore a dark eye mask and put AirPods in and outside the tunnel. Smart. So that way I never saw the clothes. You know what I mean? I just listen i just saw blackness and music and just they slid me in and i was like how long is this guy's like i can do it in eight minutes if you stay still i was like done oh, nice done yeah i had a few that were very very long i had and some 20 minuters that i just <sighs> i can't it's brutal it's terrible it's you know and i'm, and I'm being pumped up with delauded like every yeah. couple hours and i knew like they, it got to the point when like they were giving me so much delauded it was barely even affecting me and i was like like and that's I mean, I love my drugs. <laughs> and so I, but I couldn't even enjoy the Delauded. There was like, it was basically like, I, cause you were on that too, right? Yeah. For me, there was a 10 seconds as soon as they injected it. And I was like, oh, is this why people do heroin? Is this what chasing the dragon for this 10 seconds where you go, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah, but see, I, I didn't get that. That's what people loved. I didn't get, I was terrified on it. Yeah. Like what it did do though. Um, two things. It's a physical for me. It's physical and mental. The physical, it absolutely took the pain away. So I was in so much pain that it took the pain away. It didn't make me high. It just made me feel better hmm. physically. But mentally, I'm telling you, like I'm looking at you right now and just flesh chunks of your face are falling off and hitting the table <laughs> and bloody strings are oh, hanging I there. Wish I, I had that. I'm seeing the cheekbone. That's what everybody says. <laughs> made him take it away. I'm, like, get, oh, I'm sure. tripping. Get this shit out of here. I don't want this at all. No, that was, yeah, mine was more so just like, it was just maintenance. It's all it was is like, make some of this pain go away, but there was no euphoria from it, which unfortunately. Also, with all the mental anxiety going on, it's it just wrecks everything. Yeah. It's, you're not having a ball in there. No, it, no, it's all, the thing is, I can't even, my brain is so loopy that I can't even read a book. I can't do anything except lay there and watch TV. When I finally started doing physical and occupational therapy in there, I would do three hours a day and it was such a reprieve, but I was so weakened that I, the first time I tried to get out of bed, my first physical therapy session, I couldn't even get out. Me I too. could not stand up. I could, I sat up and was so dizzy yeah. and weak. I fell back and they're like, you can't do this today. Yeah, and that's yeah. kind of that was my thing too. Is that you forget the, that you're laying there so long, you, your body atrophies very quickly. Oh my god, it's wild how fast it happens. Yeah, so fast. I felt like there's old people in cocoon when I got out at first. I could touch my hamstring and it would just shake. My ass was gone. I feel like I got a nice old baseball ass. Yeah, you know what I, mean? I, I, got, I definitely have a baseball. For 50 ass. years old, I got a nice old <laughs> baseball ass. I could still fill out a pair of baseball pants. Oh baby, but uh, it was gone. It was gone. It's almost back now from physical therapy, but it was. Get the the squats gone. in there, right? I'm doing my <laughs> hip hinges and get my squats. Yeah. I thought, so I, they told me I'd been in there like 27 days or something like that. And they were like, Hey, you're going to get out tomorrow. And they were, we just have to do one more MRI. They do an MRI and realize that I have an old injury in my knee from 20 years ago Come where on. I had pulled an, or I tore an ACL and my meniscus. And they were like, you don't know about that. And I was like, I mean, I remember it happened 20 years ago and, but like, I don't feel it anymore. And the doctor was like, well, your knee's not draining from the edema. It was like four times the size of my left knee. He's like, we need to get in there and we need to do a surgery tomorrow. And I'm You've like, been you walking got, around without that, those tendons and shit for all this time. Yes. And you do, I mean, so you know me, I slack line. Yeah. I, I tightrope walk yeah. for hours at a time. And I think that's the reason why my, I never knew that I never felt knee pain is because I've strengthened mm. and rehabbed myself to this point where I have I have work on muscles that I don't even know exist. But now they have to do this surgery so it drains proper. Yeah. Hair changes can happen due to age, biology, and lifestyle. No matter the root cause of your hair concerns, Nutrafol meets you exactly where you are with science-backed formulas tailored to your needs. While Nutrafol's hair growth supplements target the root causes of thinning hair from within, Nutrafol's scalp care formulas help create a healthy environment for improved hair quality. The shampoo, scalp mask, and scalp essence are each gentle yet effective and work to exfoliate Purify and balance the scalp for improved hair health. The sulfate and silicone-free shampoo and conditioner are designed to cleanse the scalp without stripping. Nutrafol's physician-formulated scalp care products are clinically shown 
to balance the scalp and physically improve hair health and strength in two weeks with their 100% natural fragrance, zero parabens, and ingredients that are color and extension safe. Take the first step towards improved hair and scalp health now. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our U.S. listeners $10 off your first scalp care order when you go to Nutrafol.com slash scalp and enter promo code HONEYDEW. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash scalp and enter the promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. This is available only to U.S. customers for a limited time. That's Nutrafol.com slash scalp, promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I heard about Athletic Greens and decided to give them a try because my energy and my immune system could both use a little boost. It's become part of my morning routine, which means I'm starting every day feeling like I'm doing something great for my body. More than just greens, it's all your key health products like multivitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more working together as one. It's made with 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients that deliver benefits like mood, immune system, and sleep support support, sustained energy, and so much more. You can even get it in convenient travel packs for when you're on the go, like I've been using out on the live and a live tour. I've also been putting them in morning shakes now too. I've been adding in that to make sure I get my athletic greens in. We have them here at the studio as well. My friends are using them. Everybody loves them. Athletic greens is the real deal, y'all. So, If you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash honeydew. That's athleticgreens.com slash honeydew. Check it out. Now, let's get back to the do. And so, and this is the part, I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this or not, but yesterday was Father's Day, so I'll do it. So... They are, I'm in the hospital and they say, you're going to have to stay here another five days. And I'm losing my fucking mind. I'm uh, Suddenly I'm just enraged. I'm like, no, I, not more the hospital. I can't be in here anymore. Then I get a call from my sister. My dad died. No. Unexpectedly. While I'm in there. No. And they had just told me I would have to be there another five days. And I'm like, my brain just shuts down. I start screaming. I'm just like, my my wife comes in like five minutes later. She was just on her way there. She finds me just like, "Ah, ah, ah," like ugly cry, obviously. And she doesn't know. know. This is, she thinks I'm just in pain and she walks in and she's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm just like, my dad died. And she's like, what the fuck? What's happening to us right now? And I'm just like, it was everything in that moment collapsed in on me because I'm just thinking like, how did he die? He, he, I mean, he was almost 80. He, he fell in the bathroom. They think God, it might've been, falls, man. They, they think it might've been like a cardiac or something. My, my dad didn't treat himself super well over the years. He was, I mean, he was, when he started kind of slowing down, he slowed down pretty hard, you know, but, and he also did a fuck ton of cocaine over the years. <laughs> <laughs> a massive amount of oh, cocaine. Okay, <laughs> he told me one time, he told me in his life, I asked him, this is like two, a couple years ago. I was like, dad, just so, you know, just so I know, look, we're, we're old enough here. How much cocaine do you think you've done in your life? How much have you spent? And he goes, I don't know, $350,000. And I went, what? Holy hell. And he's like, He's like, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably about that. And I was just like, you bought one of Pablo Escobar's hippos for him. Like you spent enough money on cocaine that you, one of those hippos running around is a Murray Hooper hippo. And it was, and he never once did a psychedelic. Never once. Man, and I was that like, might have stopped them from doing the cocaine. I was like, you chose so wrong. I hate to tell you that, but you chose yeah, so you wrong. Did. But my dad was never the person to be introspective. He was never the, let me go in there and think about the way I've, like, you know, existed for the past whatever Listen, that might have just saved your life. You're on acid, and acid's being like, yo, I know you're having a good time here, but you might want to get this neck shit checked out. A hundred percent, I attribute the psych. I, cocaine would have been like, fuck that. Yeah, neck. more <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, you want to double dragon? Two hundreds at the same time? <laughs> I used to call it walrusing when I would take two spoons at the same time and go, Dick. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's insane. So then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, 
So nothing in my life, everything is crashing on me at the exact same time. Whereas I've been living this joyous, positive life of abundance for the past few years, now it's all coming. Like I was, you start thinking like, did I hit a kid with a car that I don't know about? Like, did I block out some horrible thing that I did to a person? Like, the-, the other thing that's frustrating too, and you can relate to this, is you're in this hospital, not for lifestyle, not for any of that. You're there because your body's got something going on, and your dad now dying also has nothing to do with you doing anything wrong either. And now you're there for five more days. So you do they have to hold the funeral and the viewing and stuff so you can get out the We didn't even um so my dad my dad was a very much like when I die, it's over, okay? Don't do things for me. Like, don't. He was. He hated the term passed away. If you said like, oh, some of my friend passed away, he'd be like, my dad would go, you mean he died? Like, my dad very much, I think he died very quickly, which is exactly what he would have wanted. Yeah, me too. Yeah, agreed. Like, he wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't all his kids around him in a bed, like, dad, you did so good. We love you. I would have liked to have some level of closure, obviously, because it was just suddenly like, what? What happened? Yeah. Be- and on the phone, my dad. Do you remember the last conversation you had with him now when you think back? He was in the that? hospital. I mean, I know that. I he know it was in the hospital. You? No, he didn't come to see me. My mom visited, but he was, uh, we didn't know, we didn't know we were going to, I was going to be in there nearly that long. And, you know, he's old enough where traveling is an ordeal. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, dad, you need to come out here. My mom flew out because she thought I was going to die. My dad was like, I, He's that, that's not going to happen. And my dad's one of those people who masks how he actually is doing. And my wife says, I very much have this quality too, where people are like, are you okay? And you're like, I'm fine. And meanwhile, it's like, your leg is bleeding like profusely. And you're like, man, eh, whatever. My dad's the same way. The last time I talked to him was three days before he died. He sounded like with all the life in the world, he's laughing. He's, you know, he's like, yeah, hey, you'll be out of there soon. Yeah. So I just didn't know. I didn't know. And when I got out of the hospital, I mean, I remember, I don't know what you were like when you got out, but I was crying so hard when I finally got released that my wife was afraid I wasn't breathing properly. Because I was like, <laughs> it was the sunniest fucking day, December 17, 2022. And I was just like, gah, 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 gah. and she's like, breathe, breathe. And, I uh, I got ugh. emotional Cause I laid them like you, I laid on my back the entire time flat and the highest I got was 30 degrees. So when I was able to go home, I asked them, I'm like, can I roll to my side? And they're like, you can roll to your side. And I was like, oh, and when I rolled to my side, I cried. I laid there and cried. It's, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. When it's all taken away from you, you don't realize the little intricacies of life that you take for granted Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And it's the simple thing of just like, oh, it like you're saying, it hurt just to roll over. Doctors would, a team of doctors and nurses would roll me over to do like injections and stuff because I was too weak to do it myself. When I got out, because I had had the surgery five days before on my knee, I was on a walker and hopping on one foot and unable to like real, I was attached to an intravenous IV for the next month. So I had to carry around a fanny pack with me anywhere I went. The tubes kept getting caught on like kitchen drawers. And she, like, you know, when you're just walking and I'm yeah, like, whoa, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. that would happen to me around my own house multiple <laughs> times a day. And you worry because you worry that it's just gonna rip the cord yeah. right out of you. And I didn't do anything basically for a full month because I didn't to go anywhere was such it took so much effort that I was just like, fuck it, I'll just be here doing my rehab, my physical therapy, all that stuff. And I think the only way I really got through it was the entire time I would just tell myself, like, this is temporary. This is not my life. This is temporary. I, I, you know you're going to get through this. You know there will be a day you'll be able to play tennis again. You'll be able to slack line again. You will be on stage again. Like, all of the things that make you a person will come back. But you have to believe they'll come back. I've never – I dealt with horrible depression when I was a kid. And people know me as a very positive, illuminating presence. And when I was in there, there were multiple times I was like, pay the fucking check, dude. Give me the fuck. Just shoot me up with too much Dilaudid or something like that. Just end it here. I don't give a fuck if this is what it's going to be moving Listen, forward. same. I got really angry 
Um, I got really frustrated. I was at the end of my, I was like, just like, what the fuck is going? Yeah, I get, I yelled at a nurse. Me too. I didn't yell. I raised my voice. I didn't yell. I did yell at the people that were supposed to take my blood and and went o for five on finding a vein. Oh. After the fifth one, I was like, "Get the fuck out of here!" And then the lady can't hurt their boss came in and it was like, "You don't have to apologize." I was like, "No, I shouldn't have cussed like that." She's like, "It's fine." Yeah, like this is their job. I All they have a, to do. I became a hard stick. Like, which is like, I was, every time I got blood taken in my life, I used to go give blood every couple of months. Like, and, and they would always be like, look at those veins. Mm-hmm. Like, they me would too. Froth. Me too. I, you don't even need to tie me off. Dude. And yeah. that's all of a sudden, I was a hard stick yeah. because my body swelled up so much. And I had nurses that were literally like, eh, eh. Those like, tiny them, ones on the side. Oh, those dude, motherfuckers I hurt. Called, I called them an excavation team because they would go in there just like, no, not in there. Let's check another corner. Bah, 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 bah. And I was just like, I, oh, I swelled up so much, they had to cut off my wedding ring. Cut it off. Cut it off. Wow. So it got to the point when it was going, I was going to lose my finger from circula- from lack of circulation if they didn't get this thing off of me. So I get woken up. I'd been in there maybe two and a half weeks. I get woken up. It's two in the morning. Six nurses are standing around me. And I'm like, what's going on here? And they're like, we need to get that ring off. And I was like, how do we do that? And they hold up this like Black and Decker style tool. And they're like, we're cutting it off. And I'm like, Okay. It took 45 minutes to get to through cut that? the ring. The entire just, zzz, the hell zzz, was it? Kryptonite? Zzz, what the fuck was that? Titanium, <laughs> I think. <Yeah. laughs> Basically, nah, it gives me all my superpowers. And the literally, and they're going, God, this thing is so tough. And I was like, you will never break our love. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like cracking them up. And they they told me at one point, like, you got to stop making jokes. Like, it, but that was like, I was able to finally get there again. Cause the first week I was in the hospital, there were no jokes. There was no smiling. There was no anything. I was just, just psychotic. And so all of a sudden I'm able to start cracking some jokes again. Part of me starts trickling back in. But yeah, when they had to cut this thing off, yeah, 45 minutes and it finally snapped. And now I just wear this silicon one that, yep. yeah. Yeah. It just don't care. Yeah. But man, I mean, just another one of those things where you're like, I never, well, never thought this would be part of my fucking day today. Everything in there happens and you're just like, I didn't even realize this was a possibility mm-hmm. in my life. Yeah. And then. I had a rule in there, like, stop telling me things that could happen. Oh, man. Because they were like, well, this could be and could and could. And I was like, stop. Yeah. I could stroke. You could, you could, you could, you could, you could. Brain bleed. Could. I was like, stop. Yeah. Stop. And, and that's like so you had clots. What I had the what I learned is clots and embolisms. The difference basically is the clot is uh, the embolism is like a piece of something gets in the way. I had palm I had massive pulmonary embolisms. Okay. So it's it's fancy for clot, really. Right. But yes, yeah. there's I've had doctors send me photos and nurses send me photos of what and, and I had a, a lady at a meet and greet was like, I had the same thing you had. You want to see my clots? And I was like, no. <laughs> She's like, can I please show them to you? I go, is it going to make you feel that much better? She's like, yeah. I go, fine. She opens her phone up. And they look like long, bloody leeches. You know, they're just clots oh. and strings of fuck, And they're just chunks that rip through you, you know. And you how had did, them in your brain. How did it make you feel when you did that, though? When you saw those pictures? Did it make you feel better? <laughs> no, I mean, it made no. her feel better. It didn't right. make me feel any better. Like, I was like, that's. But also, I, I had seen them already. So, like. But from a picture of like, this is what they look like from a nurse that sent them to me and holding them up against a ruler so you can see just how big these things really are and how how lucky you really are. Yeah. How lucky you really are that it didn't take you out. Um, because yeah. they said they were covering both my lungs and they were massive. And I was like, Oof. I learned that. So one in three hospital deaths are from sepsis. And one in five people that get, ses- that get sepsis die from it still today, which is an insane number. That's an insane number. To think it? about modern medicine yes. and how far we've come and the things that we can heal mm-hmm. instantly. And yet that one, right. for some reason, it's still kind of foreign as to what we do with it. Um, I mean, it's – when I think about – that's that's the thing is people are like, man, cancer really almost got you. It wasn't cancer that got – like it was a side effect from a surgery to heal the yeah. cancer. My back surgery wasn't the problem either. It was the fucking let me lay there for so long and clotting that almost killed me. It had nothing to do with the 
the back surgery. The back surgery will put me down, but you know. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about this now. So you get out of the hospital now. Yeah. And when are you allowed? Because now you're a month off of, of chemo. When are you allowed to go back and start working on attacking this again? So then we basically first had to, we had to go through the antibiotic treatment. For the first month, I had to be attached to this intravenous antibiotic. It would give me six doses a day. Every four hours, it would shoot another dose into me for like 30 minutes. And they said, and while I'm going through that, I cannot possibly start chemo again. And so basically every few days I'm visiting an infectious disease specialist, getting blood work done, seeing an on my oncologist to see when we can start up again. And eventually it got to the point when I could finally get off the antibiotics uh, and was take the fanny pack off. And literally like the day it came off, my oncologist was like, get me in there. Really? Put me in coach. I'm yeah. ready. And, and then, how long was that layoff? Two months? About in total, because it was a month in the hospital mm -hmm. and then a month and a half after that. It was okay. about two and a half months that paused it. But I was responding so well to the chemo that instead of doing 12 treatments total, they said, we're only need, gonna need to do eight. So we can get this out of you in four more treatments. Okay. And, that and that's was the one moment, a month or one a week? One every two weeks. Two so weeks. two. Okay. So essentially two months, which meant my last one was gonna happen on March 2nd. And I when my wife this and year. I, yeah. So wow. this is only a couple months ago. Yeah. My wife and I heard that news and we were like, okay, so if they're we we trust them, we believe them. But I also knew this is gonna take a lot of work from me. I can't sit back and just think like, okay, the chemo is gonna get through. Because also I'm not I'm in pain, my knee's still blown up. I'm like, everything about me is still not myself yet. I'm I'm hobbling around. And I had to tell myself every day, like, you better do the fucking work that they tell you to do. Not just physical, but cognitive exercises too. Because obviously, you know, our brains are everything. Like if we, I was so afraid that I would lose my quick wittedness, my retrieval of words. It's actually Dude, When still, they mentioned stroke to me, that's when I thought like, oh, fuck, because, yeah. you know, my business manager, we talked about, and he was like, you should look into disability insurance. And I was like, you know how insurance companies are. If I'm in a wheelchair, they're going to say he can roll up to a microphone. He can roll out on a stage. And they wouldn't be wrong. If, right. They wouldn't be wrong. But, but when they said stroke, I was like, I wouldn't be able to do my job then. Dude, I've learned so much I about the insurance system. I had not even system. thought about that, though. I didn't even th – that's why I was like, stop saying things that could could happen. Oh, see, I guess with you – and I, that's the difference between you and I is I learned that I had had a stroke after it. Or, so I wasn't even thinking stroke as a possibility. I'm just thinking the aftermath of how do I get my brain back now that it's mm -hmm. happened. And, and, yeah, how do I get my spirit back how do i how do i find who who i am at my core is you know i feel like this i've become this beautiful person i've done so much work on myself to really like who i am and now so much of what i like about myself has been stripped away and i have to rebuild it piece by piece same dude and that's I it's mean, been a long time to get to this point of being sort of sort of mentally healthy and yeah. trying to be a good person, good dad, good all these things. Um, but I find that it's been coming in waves for me. So um, getting the special out made me feel a little better. Um, going physically, being able to go on tour to promote the special and see friends and, you know, made me feel better. Caught my, uh, my daughter caught her first fish with me down in Austin. That's awesome. That, like things start, I got to perform the first time at the mother, uh, my first time this year. And also my first time was at the mothership. Um, and then the store and, you know, finally getting back on tour. Like when I got on tour, the, um, uh, I got two standing ovations at the end of two of my shows and I've never had to, it was Fort Wayne. Thank you, Fort Wayne, Indiana. I've never had that at the end of shows. That's the best. So these things are. It wasn't like this turn, this light switch, so to speak. That just I'm back. It's been these incremental, like man, 
Hell yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. But you know what else sucks too is like I had been practicing that. I had been practicing gratitude. I journaled every day about being grateful for my health and my daughter's health. Like I didn't need this reminder. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't need it. I was already there. And now it's made me slow down a little bit and and sort of take more in for sure. But I didn't need that, like, hey, you should be, you know, health is everything. I know it is. I I knew it was before this happened. You know, I didn't need this to prove to me that I was right, you know? That's, I mean, that's like everyone's like, so do you have like a new perspective and appreciation for life? And I'm not like, like, I I, I had this before. I had it. Yes, I I did too. I don't want to become one of these people that's like, oh my God, have you tasted water? (laughs) Like, I know you. (laughs) I know you yeah. drink water, but have I you, think this might be H three O. Have you tasted this? Like, I mean, are you really? Are you like? Yeah. Are you smelling the flowers, mm-hmm. Ryan? Or are mm-hmm. you just letting them pass you by? Like all that shit. I am trying. I was. Like, yeah, I was doing that. I, I take pictures of flowers throughout my day. I was doing that. Yeah, I was appreciating things. I don't think I was going too hard. Like I didn't need this as a reminder for me to slow down or any of that. You know, I was. I think I was doing a good pace, you yeah. know. Uh, but man, I think I was going too fast. You do? I do. I think I was. I think I spent many, many years running to like as fast as I could, thinking like the faster I run, the faster I will get there. Um, and I just think that's not true. Whereas I, I have to tell myself this year, my whole thing this year is that be the tortoise is the tortoise won the race. He was methodical. He was paced. He didn't just run by everything and not look around right there the whole time. Not. And and yeah. yeah, And that's what I, I I think I was the. So slow and steady wins the race, bro. Yep. And that's you, when you were, you're forced to slow down all of a sudden and you can't do the things that make you feel like what, who you are then you start to really pick up a lot of lessons. And I told myself when I got the cancer, I was like, this isn't going to kill me. Came a lot closer than I ever thought it would, but it's not going to kill me. So how can I use this to my advantage? Because look, I have a decent career, but when I make it through cancer, I might have a great career. <laughs> like all of a sudden, I don't know. Maybe I'll get like speaking engagements of like, you know, cancer. I've already gotten cancer benefits and shit like that coming to me. But I think all I did was strengthen my story and become like people look at me like now like they're like, oh, you're a survivor. And I'm like, that's a strong. I honestly, I feel like that's a strong word for what I am. I think I'm just a person. Like I'm a person who enjoys living my life and I wasn't ready to go yet. You know, is that a survivor? Maybe. But I don't want to be put on some, like, pedestal of, ed- of health or anything like that because there's still plenty of shit wrong with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there should not be a frame around this picture of health. I promise you, <laughs> I promise you that. You know, like, you should just move on past this picture. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a crooked picture. It's still on yeah. the wall. we got to straighten it up every once in a while. It's, man. So it, now tell me about we get back into attacking lymphoma and how long March 2nd comes and are you clear? So, Mar- yeah, March 2nd came. They waited two weeks, three weeks to do a PET scan. Uh, and when I go, oh, good. I'm so glad you brought this up, actually. Good question, Mr. <laughs> Interviewer. I'm in the story, bro. So when I went to get my PET scan, my wife was like, hey, I- I'm going to let you go on your own for this one. And she goes, but this guy is going to remember you if it's the same tech that was there the day you were stroking out. And I was like, oh, okay. She goes, he's a tall black guy and he, he's like has an island accent, like Jamaican or something. And I was like, okay. So when I show up there, this guy checks me in. And I realize, oh, this has to be the guy. And I look at him and I'm like, hey, and I have no recollection. But I go, hey, do you remember me? And he goes, no. And I was like, I was in here a few months ago and I was in a really bad state. And he goes, oh. And I went, what? And look, I'm going to do the accent because it makes the story better, okay? But he goes, I feel like I'm looking at a ghost man. <laughs> and Did I went, he guess? Uh, uh, yeah. And I went, what do you mean? He goes, you were in here w- uh, with, a, with a young woman, right? Your wife? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, man, that was the saddest day I've had in 20 years doing this job. And I went, why? He goes, because I'm looking at you then. Think, looking at your wife, thinking, this woman's about to be a widow, and she has no idea. And that hit me so hard. He's like, I can't even believe I'm looking at you right now. When you were in here, I had to hold you up. I couldn't even take you into the back room. I can't believe you're alive. And suddenly I was like, 
oh, holy sh like that's the moment, <laughs> yeah. right? That's when when a stranger looks at you and goes, I th thought you were dead. Oh, why didn't my doctors see that that morning? It was kind of all I could think about. Because I had seen my oncologist that morning of that first PET scan of and that where I was stroking out. And they were like, yeah, take some fluids, take a Vicodin, and go home, take a nap. But this guy thought I was going to die? What? What? Where did this, how did this all happen? But that's the moment where I literally got home. My wife was like, he remember you? And I was like, yeah, he remembers. Because, yeah, apparently I was that close to fucking being gone. And so I found hit, out. Uh, can I share when it hit me was when uh, my, I had a surgeon come in and cry for me. No. <laughs> oh, like, this ain't, this ain't good. Yeah, that's the last thing this you want. Good. No, no surgeons should be crying. I say, man, you, I should not be consoling you right now. He's like, oh, my yeah. Ryan, Ryan. I was like, nah, dude. I'm just so proud of the work I did in yeah. you. I don't want you to go and make it look like it was my fault. He cried. I was like, dude, what is it? Serious. All right, he's crying. Yeah. And then luckily, a few days later, I get the call. Clean fucking. Yeah. Clean bill. And honestly, I was already like in a celebratory mood. I had already booked like a Comedy Central set that like is that I was about to that I was about to film. And like I really was like, I'm using this. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna tell the cancer story. Well, it's, your, it's your it's not the cancer story, it's your it's story. It's my story. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And figuring that out in stand-up of walking in front of a crowd and essentially saying, at the time, I'm dying right now in front of you, and I'm gonna try to make this funny and alleviate your concerns as well as my own, it was quite the challenge. Because I would watch audiences like squirm. Well, there's like, no way you can't not talk about it. I talk about it now. There's no to. way you can't not. Have it to. Went, and also, I'm very fortunate to have a show with such a great audience where we can come on here and talk about this stuff and hopefully help other people. I'm going to say this now for real. If you are having any kind of health issues, definitely go get that stuff checked. Don't be like, should I? Yes, you should. You 100% should. Yep. For real. I Well, I thought about when I first got it. You don't need to take acid to tell you that. Yeah, but, you it, but it might it. help. Uh, <laughs> you should anyway. Um, the, I thought about it because you go, okay, there's two routes I can take this. I can tell people that I have cancer and I can talk about it. I can make jokes about it. Or I can go the Norm MacDonald route and pretend that I don't have it and deal with it myself and not let anybody in on my world. Mm -hmm. But I'm a very... I'm personable and vulnerable, and I'm a person who talks about – I'm not afraid to talk about myself. And so my approach right away was, no, I can't leave it in here because I think about – like, that's that's who Norm was, right? Norm was a gambler. Norm had his own issues. Norm didn't need to talk about himself ever. But I, I think about how alone he must have felt at times. And maybe that wouldn't matter to him, but to me – I would have felt like I had the secret that I wasn't telling anybody. If anybody was ever like, hey, you seem kind of down. Are you okay? I would have like been destroyed. So that's why I just told everybody when I got cancer. I made a YouTube video, put it out there. I told myself I need to accept the help. I didn't want to do a GoFundMe. My wife's sister talked me into it. She was like, when a member of a community gets sick, the other people in the community lift that member up. And right now you're that member and you need to take our help. And I'm glad I did because, honestly, letting people in is not something that I've always been good at because I like to just take care of things myself. I don't want to burden other people. Mm -hmm. But this was a moment when I said, no, I need to receive. And I I can stop the giving train for a while and I have to focus on myself. Yeah, I'm terrible at that. With with I love to help and then I don't like to accept it. You Isn't know? that crazy? Because we're it's, it's wild. Because it's, I say I want the whole thing is I say I want love all the time, and then people were offering it in so many different ways, and I was uncomfortable with almost every one of them. I, it's it's I think like, that's don't part make of, a fuss of me, please. It's part of our stand up Small nature, footprint. I think, is that we want to do it ourselves. Yeah. Right? Stand up is such a solo sport that we just think like, no, 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 I'll I'll, I'll get it myself. But I think think about my best jokes. My friends have helped me tag those things and all the whenever I do accept help or I collaborate, things get better. Yeah. So with the feeling of with my health, shouldn't it be the same? If other people, if I take in that level of like, you know, just 
there, there's the word retrieval thing not coming back to me. But basically just that level of just like we care about you, we see you. I thought about when I finally opened my phone again, because I didn't look at my phone for three weeks when I was in the hospital. I said, I cannot look at social media. I don't want to. I don't want to know what other people are doing. And I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing right now. I finally opened it up. And I had thousands of messages, as you probably did too, like an overwhelming amount. And what I did is I would lay in the hospital and I would look at the name and I would think about, I would try to remember that person, a memory with them, and I would read it while really trying to focus on them and think about it. And every one was this little shot of dopamine where I'm like, oh, this person that I haven't seen in 10 years is sending me this beautiful message. Like, that's so kind. Okay, cool. Great. To, you know, let him in. Let them in. And I really, I really did. And it helped a lot. So now what's the rest of your year like? How often do you have to go for checkups to make sure you're good? What what happens now? Every month I get blood work done Every through month. my oncologist's office. I actually have an appointment to, on Wednesday to go get that done again. Um, but on top of that, I so I ha- that happens for the next three years. I get yes. monthly blood work done. And then it goes to every three months, uh, I believe – for like the next five years or something like that. And then if we get it at that point, if there is nothing in there, then they consider me total remission. Is that what it is? What is it? Eight years total and then you're in remission if if you got nothing? Yeah, I think actually five. Oh, five. Maybe it's it's either five or it's 10. I can't remember which, but it slows down the testing a lot. And now, well, now I'm trying to figure out. So as soon as the cancer went away, my eczema came roaring back. And it was one of those things, I did not just fucking beat cancer. <laughs> I swear to God, the eczema was like, ooh, there's a bigger problem. Let's uh, go dormant for a little bit. But then literally, as soon as the cancer was out of me, the eczema was like, hey, we gave you a break, but we're, we're ready. <laughs> we're Let me get in there. So now I'm doing like allergy te- I'm trying to figure out the root of the eczema now. Because I was really hoping that it would just clear everything out of me and I would have a fresh you start. You would think chemo would probably kill everything. That's yeah. what I thought. I, I don't, I'm not against the thought of that. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was I – was, in meditations, I was going, everything gone, everything gone, fresh start health-wise. Yeah. But – so now it's just a matter of like, you know, trying to be as good to myself as I can – so that I can keep doing my job as that as I want to do it and living the life that I want to live. The biggest thing is the time that's taken away from you. You know, that month yeah. in the hospital, it's this, you're never going to get that back. No. Nope. All those appointments that we've had that we have to do, all of that stuff, it's just like it's a massive inconvenience. And I'm lucky that I don't work a regular job, that I make my own schedule. Same. I wouldn't ne- right now with physical therapy three times a week. They make me go for medical massages. They make me. Uh, I've got a, a cancer appointment this week. I have so many doctor appointments. I would. There's no job out there that where I'd be like, I gotta go, and they would be like, you you have to quit. Nope. Yeah. No, nope, not none. at all. I'm I'm so glad I work for myself. Yeah, and and that's been I mean it really got me through this period where especially with like a GoFundMe and stuff like that, everyone was like, you just need to chill, you need to relax, and you need to heal. And I was like, no, I still want to like do stuff. And like Jeff Ross told me something that he I I've never forgotten this. He goes, Alex, do not let your ambition get in the way of your healing. Yeah, and I had to hear that. Because I was, yeah, I was that person where I was like, I'm going to walk out of that fucking last chemotherapy session straight onto a stage and do a special. But let me tell you this. I, yes, but I think that's the right mindset. I was certain I was going to kick this physical therapy's ass. I was certain I was going to get in and out for this three-hour outpatient procedure, back surgery, and then whoop physical therapy's ass and be back in it in no time. Man. I think that's the right mindset. You don't want to go into it being like, oh, this is going to suck. And, right. you know, you got it. But but then you do have to temper real expectations and be like, all right, I'm 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 alive. We made it through this. Now, I really am. I'm trying my hardest every day to just be like, just focus on these 24 hours. Yeah. Then we're going to get up tomorrow. We're going to be the best person we can those 24 hours. You yeah. Know, I'm trying. That's so important. It's because- hard though when you when you do it like this because you got and with a kid, you know, and you want to have a family. You got to you're always looking ahead. Of, they're going to camp this week, and that what times this start and that start and that, where are we going here or there? 
Cancer so. put a weird pressure on me, like where now I feel like, okay, but now I have to do more like with my life. And if there's I a, don't- There's some bigger meaning or purpose. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, and whether that's true or not, my brain is going like, Alex, you, you don't waste time. Like, don't just, just sit around all day, like reading a book, like don't do this. Like, and I'm like, but I also, I need to be good to myself and I can't rush into the rest of my life because there is still so much more to go. And there's that weird pressure of like, okay, I know I'm going to beat cancer. So what can I do after that to utilize it? So I can be a better person and have, you know, in every way. And it kind of puts a weird surviving puts a weird pressure on you in that, in that state. And that is the place where I do feel like a survivor where I'm like, Oh, I don't know what to do now. Because I had this, I never had this feeling of fragility before, but I do now, and I'm not exactly sure the best thing to do to move forward. But I think that's just going to come with time and patience. Dude, thank God. I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, for yeah. real. I know you've got a long road ahead of you, but I'm glad you're okay today. Yeah, right? thanks, man. I appreciate um, it. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing the story, being vulnerable. And you know what we do over here. This is your first time. So advice now, after everything we've talked about today, you would give to 16-year-old Alex Hooper. First of all, 16-year-old Alex Hooper would have said, shut up, old man who kind of looks like me. Fuck you. You don't know anything. <laughs> like He would have been a fucking <laughs> asshole to whoever tried to give me advice i know that for sure <laughs> um but the main thing is is focus <laughs> what i would have wanted to get through to my 16 year old self is like the world is not against you and if you can just realize that you have a place in it and you can lead with love instead of with this rebellious spirit that is inside of you there is a way to move forward that will service you and I think as a 16 year old, I never would have under, I didn't understand that at all, that there, I didn't think there was a future, but just like tell them to calm the fuck down a little bit and just be patient and find, focus on the things that you truly enjoy. And I think that's what has gotten me to where I am. If I can, like you said, gratitude and just focusing on the things that do make me happy. It really changes every single day I wake up and I'm like, there's opportunity out there. Yeah. And I don't know when things are going to change drastically for worse or for better. So I better just appreciate what the fuck's going on right now if I feel good about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Thanks. Um, please plug and promote everything one more time. Uh, yeah, so uh, Comedy Central set is dropping on August 9th. Uh, my podcast is Dirty Briefs. It's weekly. It's super short. Uh, go listen to it if you like my voice. And uh, yeah, HooperComedy.com for all those tour dates. Go get it, everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, RyanSickler.com. Ryan Sickler on all your social media. Get those tickets. Come out and see me on tour. All tickets at RyanSickler.com. We'll talk to you all next week.